Hi there, it's Michael here and today we're going to be doing a video tutorial on how to make a pushable box in UDK using Kismet. So, to begin with, I just want to talk about the game type uh, that I'm going to be using. For this I'll be using a custom game type called JM2012 Game Info. All I'm using this for is to allow me to use custom Kismet nodes. These allow me to change the camera, which will make things easier for you to see, uh, as well as changing the speed of the character and the assets involved, in including the anim tree and the anim set. In the anim tree itself, uh, there is also it is set up to allow for a push animation when play speed drops below a certain amount. Uh, that that in itself is all I'll be using the custom game type for. So don't worry, there's no need to switch off. Uh, you sh you'll still be able to create this 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 effect in normal default UDK. Uh, okay, so first start off. Um, explain the scene a little bit. This is just a, a normal scene that I've, I've created uh, using the UDK assets. And in this scene, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we have a, a, a little sort of area here with interp actors positioned around the edge. These are used as boundaries that uh, various dynamic triggers on this box will use as collision, uh, to detect collision. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about the the box itself, the, the way it's set up. The, what I currently have here, just un, ungroup, uh, unlock the groups, we have an interp actor which is the box itself, the asset. Attached to this we then have three uh, three, four dynamic triggers. These are positioned around the edge of the box like so. This is, these are created using simple BSP brushes um, and then adding a dynamic trigger volume and then just repositioning it uh, to the right dimensions around the box. If we go down to, into top, top down mode and I zoom into the box uh, talk a bit a bit more about the way the the dynamic trigger volumes themselves are set up. I've tried to ensure that they are only a one unit thick, where well, one unit wide, thick, uh, and I've also made it so that they touch perfectly in the corners, the slight slope. This is done to ensure to help try and reduce the chance of uh, when it hitting hits an interp actor, uh, it will touch any of the other the triggers around the edge. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how we actually use those in the Kismet very shortly. The next thing uh, that we have attached to the box uh, is four normal triggers that are placed in the middle uh, of each, each, each side uh, of the box. As you can see here, these are also attached to the central box just like the dynamic triggers which you can access using the attachments panel. <coughs> these are set to a hard attach and ignore base rotation. And this is the same uh, for the uh, dynamic trigger volumes except for the ignore base rotation. In most cases you won't need this uh, unless you're going to be rotating the box. The final thing this box has for the setup is a trigger in the middle. And based on its radius, let's go to the top down view again, it's, it comes out but slightly overlaps the corners as you can see 
Uh, and what this is used for is to change the player's pawn speed uh, to allow for the animation to, to play. Uh, as well as slowing the player down so it looks more believable that, that the box itself has weight. Uh, okay, uh, so I'll quickly, quickly show the box in action uh, and then we'll talk about the kismet uh, used to get this box to actually move. Okay, so if we walk into the box around the center, it'll move away from the player. Uh, and if you notice, the box itself actually stops. And it will no longer go f any further forward because of the dynamic trigger volumes uh, that are being triggered when they touch these interpactor actors around the edge. What we can then do is go on to the other side uh, and continue to push it and it will keep moving until it then touches this side here where it's stopped again but we can keep moving it as much or as little as we want like so okay then now let's jump into the kismet I'll first start off with the middle trigger so the trigger in the center this is what this this here is uh, we then use a custom Kismet node that, that simply allows us to change the player's pawn speed. Uh, this, of course, you, you won't have access to, uh, but if you are competent in, in scripting, uh, in real script, you, I'd, I'd assume you'd be able to make your own custom Kismet node to change the player's pawn speed. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the collision detection. These are the four dynamic triggers on the outside of the box that are set up in the touch types to only become activated with interp actors, as you can see here. This is a massive long list uh, I've chosen interp actors. In the sequence events, the other thing I've changed is the max trigger count, which I have set to zero, and the re-trigger delay, which is also set to zero. This just means that you can instantly reactivate the trigger again without any issues of, of the box then passing through what you want to be a boundary. Uh, the most important thing I've changed is the player only. This is unchecked, unticked. If this is ticked, it means that only the player can trigger it, and we don't want that. We want to allow all the interp actors that it touches to trigger it. So having it unticked just allows uh, UDK to use the touch types, which is normally set to pawn by default, which we don't want. Uh, this is the same throughout all these four dynamic trigger volumes. Uh, and these all come, up, come off onto a, a toggle. So from touched, it goes into a turn on, and then on an untouched, it goes onto a turn off. Uh, and what this does is when the trigger volume touches uh, an interp actor, it will turn on a boolean. And then when it's untouched, it turns it off, so it sets it to false, so true false. We then have these booleans themselves named. And the way that they are named is dependent upon the side in which the trigger is on. For example, this trigger volume here, trigger volume 4, is on the positive x side of the box. So when we're moving the box, when it gets when it's touched, we want it to stop moving in a positive x direction. Uh, and that is the sort of similar across the board. So obviously we have a, a y plus collision here. So when this gets turned to true, we want the box to stop moving in, in a positive y direction. Uh, this simply just allows us then to move the box in the opposite direction. Uh, without having to worry about stopping the box from moving altogether. Okay, now then, let's move on to the four triggers that are on the outside of the box. These triggers themselves are what, what are used to determine which direction the box should move in. These are set to only get triggered by the player, so the pawn and I simply 
I've simply changed the max trigger cap to zero and the re-trigger delay to zero as well. Everything else is, is the same. From here, it then goes into a toggle. So touch, turn on, untouch, turn off. Which then goes into a, a compare ball and they share the same ball. This just allows us to, in, in this scenario, uh, create a loop and break a loop when we, when we want to, uh, which we'll, I'll explain a bit more about later. So from here, as long as the ball is true, so is touched, it will then go on to a compare ball. And here, we have a collision one of the collision variables we set over here. So these two are the same. This here is just using a named variable which happens to be this one. You can access all named variables in the, the new variable, named variables in persistent level panel. Uh, and the way we decide which one we want it all depends on which direction we want to go in. So this trigger here will be on the minus side X minus X side of the box. So when that's triggered, we want it to go into it in the plus direction of the box, which is the side the trigger's on. So assuming that this isn't being touched, we want it to then continue on and actually move the box. If it's touched, then it won't move at all because it won't allow it to get any further. From here, what we then do is using a get location and rotation we get the location rotation of the interpactor, in this case the box, uh, and we set them to variables which I've, I've named. So in this case box location and box rotation. From here we then go into a get vector components. And, if, and all this does is it takes a vector and splits it up into its three components. A vector in itself is made up of three components, x, y and z which you can edit individually in the properties panel. So what this allows us to do is using the the box location which we have here we, ha we are able to split its, its vector components, the x, y and z, into their own individual variables. Uh, so we have box x, box y and box z. This simply allows us to individually change each variable, allowing us uh, a lot of control in terms of, of what we, how we want the box to move. What we then do from here is we then go into an add flow. Of course we only use an add flow when we are moving in a positive manner. <clears throat> and all we, all we do in this scenario is we take the box X and we add one which means that the new box X is what it was previously plus one. So if the X location was 26, it would then be 27. From here, we then go into a, a set vector components. Uh, and what the set vector components does is it takes the three components, to, well, can take three components and puts them into one vector. Uh, and the way a location works is it has to be a vector because it needs to know all three locations. So we then input the new box x value we have along with the y and z and we then put it back into the box location so the box location vector is now a slightly different number compared to what it was originally over here <clears throat> we then use a set actor location which then sets the, the location of the box to its new location uh, as well as using the box rotation uh, to ensure that it's it's always aligned the same way. From here, from the end of here, we then have it looping all the way back to the beginning to this first compare ball. And the reason we do this is so once it gets to the end, assuming the player is still touching the trigger, it will continue to move. Uh, this means that the player doesn't have to move forward to move back to then move forward just to get it to move. Of course, with any loop, you need to ensure that there is a delay. Uh, in this in this scenario, we have a delay of 0.01, simply because it is the shortest delay you can have. 
without it not working at all. If the delay is too short, it won't work. Um, so yeah, in terms of, of the, the Kismet, it's exactly the same sort of concept applied to all the other axes. So underneath we have the, the Y plus, and it's just taking uh, the box Y and adding one, uh, which is the box movement speed, which is a, a named variable yet again. And this is just adding it and, and resetting the location. And this is consistent throughout all all the four directions. So yeah, that's how it works. This is the kismet involved in terms of, of getting the box to move from one location into another. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So yeah, that is how to make a pushable box in UDK. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you've learnt something about the Kismet nodes um, and how you can use the dynamic trigger volumes uh, and, and even how to attach things to objects. Uh, so in the next part, I will be showing you how to use K actors um, to simulate this box falling from this ledge over here. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you for watching and tune in next time.